But now for the last part in our series on Romans. And we're going to deal with Romans chapter 11 today. And the big question I want to answer today is this one. How should we as Christians think about the modern day nation of Israel? And for those of you who are busy stay-at-home moms or dads, why should this even matter to you in your everyday life? Because this is something that Christians disagree about, argue about, some Christians are obsessed about, some Christians don't care about, but how should we think about the modern day nation of Israel, which is often in our news? And it's something that Christians for 2,000 years have actually been obsessed with, because most of our Bible is filled with the stories of this ancient nation of Israel. I mean, the entire Old Testament is about them. It's written by them. It's their story. It's centered around them. And then we wake up in the morning, and we look at the news, and there's Israel still there in the world today. And the question is, are these the same things? How should we think about them? And what, if anything, does that have to do with our everyday lives? Now, historically, and again, I'm oversimplifying a lot, but historically, there have been kind of three basic ways, and again, there's more than this, but there's been sort of three basic major foundational ways that Christians have approached this thing of what do we think about the nation of Israel, and what do we think about the Jewish people, all right? So one way, and this one tends to be more Christians recently, like in the last century or so, particularly since Israel became a, moder- a, a nation again in modern times, is a lot of Christians have this idea that God is for the Jewish people, which of course God, you know, I believe God is for all people, but there would be this idea that God is for the Jewish people in a special way, more than everybody else, all right? Lots of wonderful Jesus-loving Christians in this camp, and lots of Jesus-loving Christians in different camps, all right? Another way of Christians thinking about the nation of Israel and the Jewish people is that the Jewish people and Gentile people are just equal in all ways before God. All ethnicities, Jews are not more special, they're not less special, they're just another nation along with all the rest of the nations in the world. The third way, I'm going to say his, uh, is a more, definitely a negative way, uh, on, definitely on a continuum, but historically this one has been very popular, is this idea that God is actually, because of the crucifixion, Because of what happened to Jesus on the cross, there's this idea of blaming the Jewish people for killing God. And it might not be sort of as popular in our area today in modern times, but historically this has been very popular, is this idea that God is actually against. So on the opposite end of the spectrum is that God is somehow especially for Israel in a special way more than other nations. But then on the other side is this idea that God is actually against the Jewish people, that they're under his punishment and condemnation more than Gentiles, all right? And historically, again, sadly, many, many Christians went with option three, some of them in a more gentle way, but many of them in ways that became overtly racist. And this is actually really important. We're going to get into Romans right away, but I want you just to be patient for just the first few minutes here because... I think there are some things in Christian history that every Christian needs to know. And the history of Christian anti-Semitism. Now, that's a big word. If you're here today, you're younger or something, and you don't know what that means, it means specifically racism against Jewish people. The history of Christian anti-Semitism is really bad, and most, or many at least, modern Christians have no idea about it. I want to just read you a couple of quotes from influential, respected church leaders in the fourth century. And I want you to see how terrible some of their quotes are and what people, many Christians, believed about Jewish people throughout history. Here's St. Gregory of Nyssa. Notice the saint. All right? He was sainted by the church. He is, his writings are still respected today. And, of course, he does have some very good things to say, but he has some horrible things to say. He starts off, he says this, He lived in the the 4th century. He said, Jews are slayers of the Lord. So this is a common thing throughout church history. 
blaming the Jews for killing Jesus. Never mind that it was Roman soldiers who did the crucifying and Roman governor. There was participants, there was Jewish leaders who participated in it, certainly. But there's many Jews who love Jesus. But he says, Jews are slayers of the Lord. And then he goes on to say some absolutely horrific things. And this is a respected church leader. Now imagine, when respected church leaders are saying this, imagine what the followers are thinking and doing. This is our Christian history. And there are some things in our history that every Christian should know. He goes on to say, Jews are slayers of the Lord, murderers of the prophets, enemies and haters of God, adversaries of grace, Enemy, enemies of their father's faith, advocates of the devil, a brood of vipers, slanderers, and scoffers, men of darkened minds, the leaven of Pharisees, the congregation, and on and on and on. By the way, I could show you many quotes like this from the most famous church fathers you can think of. St. Augustine is one you can probably all think of. Justin Martyr is another one that many of you can all think of, often known as one of the first martyrs of the Christian church who said absolutely horrific things about the Jewish people. I'm just going to show you one more by another guy, also St. John Chrysostom. This guy uh, is known in Christian history, even now in seminaries, he's known as one of the greatest preachers of all time. His sermons are studied. Now, thankfully in seminaries, they don't study this sermon. But he gave a series of sermons. It was like eight different sermons. Like he went for like a couple of months. Imagine if you came here for eight weeks and I was going on about how bad the Jews are. That's what St. John Chrysostom, a respected church leader, did in the 4th century as well. He says this, Are they not inveterate murderers, destroyers, men possessed by the devil? Jews are impure and impious, and their synagogue a lair of beasts, a place of shame and ridicule, on and on and on. It's hard to even read. But this is not rare in Christian history. In fact, again, it wasn't all Christian leaders, but it was many respected Christian leaders, were very racist towards Jewish people. They had this idea that the Jews were to blame for what happened to Jesus. Never mind that we're all actually glad that Jesus died for our sins. Isn't that true? But this theology came in. It said, actually, the Jews are bad. They're evil. And now God is against them. And largely because of this, racism moved with Christianity into Europe. So throughout the Middle Ages for centuries, uh, you know, Europe was a, you know, a Christian continent, the Christian continent uh, on, in, in the world. And racism got very, anti-Semitism towards Jews, got very deeply ingrained in Europe, by the way, which led up to World War II and the Holocaust. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But you say, like, what kind of verses? How could Christian leaders even think this way about Jewish people? How could, how could that ever happen? It's so horrific. And you have to remember that one of the things we have to be so careful of as Christians, and it's one of the reasons I'm very passionate when I preach, to talk about how we need to be humble in the way we read the scripture. Because the fact of the matter is that all of us have various biases and blind spots. And what we human beings will do with biases and blind spots is we will find evidence for our biases and blind spots. And so these, a lot of these Christians, these Roman and Greek Christians, had deep biases against Jewish people. And so, of course, when they read the Bible, they found passages to support what they believed. I'll just show you a couple of passages. I can show you many more. You'll notice if you read the New Testament that the New Testament writers often speak about the Jews. They're not actually intending to talk about the whole ethnic group of Jews because the writers themselves are Jews. But instead of talking specifically about Jewish leaders, they will just say, the Jews. So you'll find passages that actually sound horrible if you take them the wrong way. So for example, Acts 13, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul, now never mind that Paul himself is a Jew, was saying and heaped abuse on him. You will find verses like this throughout the New Testament, and lots of Christians found confirmation for their biases in the Bible. They said, see, the Jews are now, they're now below the other nations. They're under God's condemnation and judgment. I want to just show you one more passage. And again, my point here is humility and love when reading the scripture are absolutely essential. The moment we think, we at, whatever I think the Bible says is absolutely right, 
That's where we have to be careful. That's where we need each other. That's where we need the Holy Spirit and humility and prayer. Look what 2 Thessalonians says. For you, brothers and sisters, Paul says to the Thessalonian Christians, are, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered, by the way, Paul's writing this, and remember, he is a Jew. From your own people, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. Again, he doesn't specify just a small group. He's not talking about all the Jews. He's a Jew. But now look at what he goes on to say, who killed the Lord Jesus. Passages like this are exactly what uh, Roman and Greek Christians in the early church for centuries said, see, the Jews are to blame. And the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. And based on passages like this, Christians who already had biases found scriptural support and blamed the Jews and said they are under condemnation. So much so that by the time of the 15th and 16th century, when you get the Protestant Reformation, one of our biggest heroes as evangelicals, now you might not know some of this, I'm just giving you a little bit of history. But we should all know a little bit of our history. If we're Christians, we should just know a little bit of Christian history. One of our, as we're kind of, we're, we're called under this big umbrella, Protestants, and then under that umbrella, we're evangelicals. That's what we would be as a church here. Protestants split off of Catholic, Catholicism, all right? And for Protestants, one of our heroes is Martin Luther. How many of you have ever heard of Martin Luther? Please tell me. And the rest of you, I'm going to recommend some books and some YouTube videos. That's maybe better than a book. Martin Luther is the guy who nailed up the 95 theses on the, you know, the, you know, and probably some of that is a little bit legendary, but whatever, he's the guy that kind of, he's the hero, he got us out of the Catholic Church. Phew! And he did. God used him. He did some great things. He also had some horrible, horrible views about Jewish people. And again, I want you to, uh, well, oh yeah, and the wrath of God has come upon them last. Look at that Second Thessalonians passage, it's even worse. Uh, if you read it that wrong way, not as Jewish leaders, but as the Jewish people as a whole. But look at what uh, Martin Luther said. We are at fault for not slaying them. That's the Jews. Rather, we allow them to live freely in our midst despite the murder, cursing, blasphemy, lying, defaming. This is actually like someone that many evangelicals consider a Christian hero. Now, some Christians try to defend this. They say, well, it was just his culture. Excuse me. Uh, didn't Jesus say 1,500 years before Martin Luther, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, love all people, like we should know better? Actually, you don't get, we, as Christians, guess what? We're actually called to be better than our culture. So we don't need to try to excuse this. Yeah, he was part of a vulgar culture, but we don't need to excuse this. This is part of our history of interpretation of Scripture and abuse towards the Jewish people. And the Nazis, when they came along a few centuries later, were definitely not Christians. They hated Christianity. But they were happy to quote Christians like Martin Luther and to capitalize on the racism that Christianity itself had helped to propel in Europe. All based on this idea that God is actually angry and condemning against the Jews. Now, in Romans 11, Paul is already, this is the craziest thing. So we've been in this series on Romans. In Romans 11, Paul is already coming against this exact thing. So I want you to see in Romans 11, he's going to, in this part, so remember we've been talking in Romans about how Paul is trying to bring two groups of people together where there's ethnic tension. You got Jewish Christians, you got Roman Christians. In a lot of the book, he's talking to the Jewish Christians. He's telling them, stop judging the Romans and don't make them do all your Old Testament customs. They don't have to. But now in chapter 11, in the second half of chapter 11, starting verse 13, he's going to start speaking specifically to the Gentiles, the Roman Christians, the non-Jews. By the way, anybody who doesn't know what this word means, Gentile just means non-Jew, right? This, it appears hundreds of times in the Bible. You just learn something. I'm talking to you Gentiles, all you non-Jews. That's us. And he says this, if some of the branches, that's the Jews in this analogy, I don't have time to show you the entire chapter, but you can go back and you can read it, you can mark it down, have been broken off, and you, that's the Gentiles, the non-Jews, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Now look what he says. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. 
already in Paul's day. Paul's writing this like somewhere in the 50s AD. And already here, you know, more than a thousand years before Martin Luther, hundreds of years before Chrysostom and Gregory of Nyssa and all the rest, already here in the 50s AD, you have non-Jewish believers who consider themselves superior to the Jewish believers. They look down, there's already racism and ethnic tension happening because of racism as these Roman Christians look down on the Jewish Christians. Now, why are they looking down on them? So now he quotes them back to themselves. He's going to quote, he's speaking to the Gentile Christians, and he's going to quote them back to themselves. You, that's you Gentile Christians, will say then, the branches, that's the Jews, were broken off so that I could be grafted in. There was this idea that God's done with the Jews, so he broke them off, and now it's the Gentiles' turn. Part of that is true. The part that's true is it is the Gentiles' turn, but it's not an either-or. It's a both-and. It's not God's big enough to love the whole bunch of us, Jew and Gentile, right? Amen? But the Gentiles were saying, no, 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 no. He's done with them now. They crucified Jesus, so he broke them off. Done. They're now under condemnation. By the way, and they pointed to all kind of history and news to make their point. We sometimes do this too. Because lots of terrible things had happened to the Jewish people. So in somewhere around 49 AD, Chris Lowen talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Somewhere in 49 AD, the, Rome, the, uh, the emperor of the Roman Empire kicked all the Jews out of the city of Rome for a few years. And they had just come back when, uh, you know, uh, when Paul was writing this letter. That's why there was te tension again. Then in 70 AD, the Romans uh, sacked the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. And you know what Christians said when they read the news? They didn't have newspapers, but I'm just, you know. You know what Christians said when they read the news? They said, see, they crucified Jesus. Look at all the bad things happening to the Jews. God is judging them. By the way, isn't that what so many of us modern Christians today do? I sometimes hear it in Christian circles. You read the newspaper, something bad happened somewhere, and right away, some Christian leader or writer somewhere is going to go, God's judging them. That's what these Gentile Christians were doing. God is ju judging those Jews. He's done with them. But Paul actually doesn't agree with them. He goes on, granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. Notice that they are not broken off, and by the way, it's not all of them, the guy writing this book is a Jew. But they were broken off because of ethnicity, because they were descendants of Abraham? No, based on unbelief. Same as Gentiles. If you're a Jew and you don't believe, if you're a Gentile and you don't believe, then you're not part of the family of God, and you stand by faith. You're not in because you're Gentile. You're in because you believe in Jesus. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. I don't know what's next. I'm going to see. Right. Okay, good. Just a couple verses later. And if they, now notice the if there, if they, the Jews, do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. It's all based on belief and faith. That's what Paul's saying. Nobody's out because of ethnicity. Nobody's in because of ethnicity. You can't blame the Jews for killing Jesus, there were some Jewish people involved, there were all some Roman people involved. If it would have been in our day and God had come to Canadians, it would have been Canadians. We just wouldn't have crucified him. We would have done something nicer. But it still would have been bad. So then Paul keeps going. So remember, this whole section of Romans 11, he's speaking to the Gentiles. Don't be arrogant. Do not look down these Jewish people. God is not done with them. So he goes on. He says in verse 25, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Now, by the way, if you're following in your Bibles or on your phone, highlight that word mystery. Because lots of what we're about to see of the confusion with this passage comes from Christians thinking that this is no longer a mystery. And they figured it out. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. So notice... Not everyone, some Jews got saved, like Paul, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Now, 
usually Christians just gloss this over. I wish that my brain was just able to gloss over and just keep going and not ask questions. But for many years, I've asked the question, why did the Jewish people have to reject Jesus in order for Gentiles to receive him? Why couldn't they just have happily received Jesus and then the Gentiles see how happily they received Jesus and then the Gentiles and Jews all happily receive Jesus? I don't know the answer to that question. He's the apostle, I'm not. But however he's reasoning, he says, for some reason, the Jews had to go, nope, so that the Gentiles could say yes. All right, Paul, you're the boss. You're the one who's in, you know, who's getting to write scripture, not me. And in this way, now look at this, all Israel will be saved. He's saying, speaking to these Gentiles, and he's saying, don't think God's discarded the Jewish people on a trash heap. And then he goes as far as to say, all of them will be saved. And now we get a bunch of Christians, some Christians, not a, whatever. Many of them wonderful. Me as one of them for many years. And lots of them still wonderful, but they swing the other way now. We go from a history of like, many Christians thinking the Jews are bad, God's against them, he judges them. And now in modern times, since World War II, we get a swing the other way. By the way, I prefer this way to the other way. That's the worst way. But we get to swing the other way, and we have these Christians that see this, all Israel will be saved? And they swing the other way now, and it's like there's this magical thing with the Jewish people where God actually likes the Jewish people more than other people. That there's actually a special plan where all Jewish people will someday be saved. And Christians go all kinds of places with this. Some Christians even go so far as to say, that Jews can be saved without accepting Jesus based on this verse because all Jews are just going to be saved. And Gentiles are actually the ones who need Jesus, all right? But here's the problem with that. As Chris Lowen also told us a couple of weeks ago, we have to remember that we can't take single verses in the Bible. I can find single verses that say all kinds of super wild things. We can't build huge doctrines on single verses that then contradict lots of other ones because Paul's whole purpose, what was Paul's whole purpose in writing the book of Romans? Oh, by the way, I'm going to go one more verse here because it gets more than this even. Look at this. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. That's the Jewish people. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So it sure seems like, what? He's got this special deal with the Jews that he doesn't have with anybody else who's a non-Jew. So now you get this other thing where the Jews are extra special. So we've had Christians who say God is against the Jews. Now we have Christians who say God favors the Jews more than other people. You have Christians who go so far as to say, if you give the gospel to Jews first, God will bless you. Wonderful, smart, intelligent people that say that. All right? So this, now, if God favors the Jews, let's go to that side now, not the side where Christians are against the Jews. If God favors the Jews over others, that raises a bunch of other questions, which actually have some practical application for how we think about the news and how we act as Christians today. If God favors the Jews over other ethnic groups, like if he has a special plan for them where he's going to save all of them that he doesn't have with any other nation, should we automatically support everything the government of Israel today does? That's a very practical question for our modern world. Should we? Are the Israelis, so that's a modern, when we're talking about ancient Israelites, we talk about Israelites. When we talk about modern Israelites, we talk about Israelis. Are the Israelis automatically always right and the Palestinians automatically always wrong? That's another big question. Because there are Christians now, there are groups of Christians that would automatically say Israel can do no wrong, the modern nation of Israel. It's like they can't distinguish between the ethnic group of Jewish people and the political government of a, of a nation. There are Christians who would say automatically Palestinians always wrong and automatically Israelis always right because God is on their side. God is for the Jews. 
And then, of course, this question which I brought up before, which seems, Paul seems to say in those verses, are Jewish people automatically all saved even without Jesus? Well, if we... That's the purpose of Romans. I want to go back now to Romans 3. If we get outside of Romans 11 a little bit and just take a breath. Sometimes that's what we have to do. We get into a little verse like this. We've got to step back. We've got to go, what's the bigger picture what God, of what Paul's saying? Romans 3. Paul says this, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Just Gentiles or Jews and Gentiles? What Paul goes on to say, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. I want to just read that again. This is really important. And again, this is what Christians, we Christians can get so caught up in. As you read this one little verse, it's like, well, he's got some special plan for Israel that he doesn't have for anyone else. Meanwhile, in many other passages, he says things like, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Now remember, this is a huge reason why Paul is writing the book of Romans. There's ethnic tension between Jewish Christians and Roman Christians. The last thing he would want to do is put Jews above Romans or put Romans above Jews. So one of the things he's going to stress throughout is that there's no differences the only people who are saved, they're, nobody's saved by being a Jew. Nobody's saved by being a Gentile. Jews and Gentiles both are saved the same way. Why? For all have sinned. Now, right away, any of those past Christians like Martin Luther and John Chrysostom and St. Gregory of Nyssa and all these guys who talked, the Jews are worse because they killed Jesus. Paul actually says, actually, no nation is worse than another. No nation. For all have sinned, both Jew and Gentile. No difference. All have sinned. You can't just blame the Jews for killing Jesus. All, no difference, Jew and Gentile. They're all equal on the same playing field in terms of needing Jesus' forgiveness. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now we can actually find this in other writings too as I'm coming to a close here, but I want to take you to Galatians briefly. And then I'm going to wrap this up. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now look what he says. There is neither, because of this, because of Jesus, there is neither, in front of Jesus, in front of God, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all, how many? One, in Christ Jesus. This actually speaks to Christians on both ends of the spectrum. The ones who for centuries were against the Jews and said they were in trouble with God says actually there is no Jew or Gentile. There's only one family. And those who think have gotten this other idea that Jews are somehow extra special so we need to, everything, you know, Israel does or this or that, it's like we have to support, we have to support, we have to support no matter what. Actually, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now Paul's actually going to go one step further. And I'm going to come back to that. I want to go to the next passage here. Next verse. For if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Now this is something many Christians miss in Paul's writing. It's all over the place. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul's whole point here, he's trying to bring Gentiles and Jews together. The way to do that is to stop having two families and make one family. So he says to us who aren't Jews, we are now the descendants of Abraham by faith. Now, I'm going to go back here. In Jesus, there is no Jew or Gentile. Here, if you want to write something down or if you want to take a picture of something, this is a very practical one. What does this mean in terms of how we interpret the news today, how we read the news, and how we engage with the world as Christians? In Jesus, there is no Jew or Gentile. So that means God loves Jews and Gentiles the same. That means God does not favor Jews or Gentiles. That means God is not on the side of Jews or Gentiles. 
That means God does not save Jews differently than non-Jews. There's one family. Jews and Gentiles save the same. Jews and Gentiles love the same. And it also means that with the nation of Israel, there is not one nation in the world that God owns against all the other nations. I mean, that's an idea, another idea that lots of us as Christians, is, that I've even preached in the past, this idea that God specifically owns the nation of Israel, but not the other nations. You know what the Bible actually teaches? The earth is the Lord's, and how much? Everything. One more time. And how much? Everything, Everything in it. The world and all who live in it. So does God just own the nation of Israel? He owns everything. He owns Canada. He owns France. He owns Mexico. Now, we're not living like he owns everything. There's going to be a time when he comes and he sets up his kingdom on earth, and that's going to be time one. But he owns everything. There isn't one nation he owns, and he's against all the other nations. And all. It's not just one group of people he favors like the Jews. Because of Jesus, there is no more Jew and Gentile. We are all equal before God. So, to use a little bit more modern terminology, in Christ, there is no Israeli or Palestinian. Doesn't that have a different feel to it than there is no Jew or Gentile? This just actually kind of brings it home. In Christ, there is no Israeli or Palestinian. The nation of Israel is just a nation. So what does that mean? It means as Christians, first of all, I certainly don't have the solution. You say, what do we do for world peace? Uh, Jesus, come back, please. What do we do to solve the Middle East's problems? No idea. Here's what I do know. I'm a follower of Jesus. That means I love both Israelis and I love Palestinians. I'm a follower of Jesus, so that means I don't like it when I hear about Israelis being attacked, and I don't like it when I hear about Palestinians suffering. I don't like both. I don't ignore one and pay attention to the other. I don't pay attention to one and ignore the other. I love both because I'm a follower of Jesus. So then we go back to that one statement. Well, why would Paul say all Israel, like not all Canada, not all South Africa, not all Madagascar, but all Israel will be saved. What's with that? Well, here's a good answer for you. I don't know. And neither do most commentaries. You read all the good commentaries, you read this one, he says, ah, I think it could be this. You read this one, ah, I think it could be this. Why did Paul? He's in heaven right now going, God, can I put some white out on there and rewrite that for these crazy modern Christians? Here's what we know. We know from everything else Paul says, you're only saved by faith, not your ethnicity. We also know, he said it right in this ch same chapter, just three verses before this, he said, and if, if means they won't all do it. If they, the Jews, some of them do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So Jews and Gentiles, we all need Jesus. We're all in the same playing field. We're all saved the same way. Now, some of you, you don't ever like to read the news. You go, great, now I know what I think about Israel. I never think about Israel. Okay, cool. Let's finish this and try and make it super practical. For those of you who do think about these things, we're Christians, that means we love Jews and we love Palestinians, we love them both. Here's something for all of us as Christians, be careful about building extreme views based on single passages. I can't say it enough. Before you go believe in something wacky, just because someone quoted to you one verse, stop drop and roll. It's okay to say you don't know. Number three, God is not against any people groups in this world. 
I would like to add something to that because I was in a rush to get dunked in the water tank. If God didn't discard the Jews because a group of them actually did conspire with the Romans to get him crucified, if he didn't discard them for that, what could you possibly do that would get God to discard you? Nothing. Nobody gets discarded. No people group gets discarded. No individual people get discarded. Why don't you bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Thank you, Father, for Romans. There is a lot of intense stuff in there. Father, I want to say out loud, I don't think it's bad for us to sometimes have to say things like this. On behalf of historical Christianity, we did some horrible things and said some horrible things about the Jewish people. Please forgive us. Please forgive us for just not even knowing our history and being too confident. And then, Lord, there isn't a person here today. There might be someone here who thinks or feels like they're on the discard pile. They've gone through something horrible. They've gone through a marriage breakup. They've done something horrible. Father, you don't discard anyone. You can always graft us back into your family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this summer. Thank you for practical little things like Sunday morning services. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.